Welcome uh, everybody to this uh, afternoon session of uh, Climate Europe 2 Festival. And in fact, this is the last session of the second day and the last session of the business day. And uh, today, uh, this afternoon is going to be dedicated to the relevance of quality assured climate services for the renewable energy sector. Uh, my name is Asun Sinclair, and I work as climate change lead for DMB Group Research and Development. And I also work as visiting leading researcher at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. So I think this is quite well known that renewable energy systems are hugely dependent both on climate variability and climate change. And uh, this is not only about the vulnerability of the actual energy infrastructures, but also both production and distribution need to be adapted to climate impacts. The energy sector, in addition, uh, needs to report to existing guidelines from the financial sector and to the requirements for disclosing climate risk. And this has been one of the topics together with energy in the morning session uh, uh, today, uh, where we have been discussing the importance for all companies to appropriately identify transitional and physical risks. And we have also heard this morning that climate services are critically for the energy transition and for science-based decarbonization and net zero strategies. So clearly operationalizing and standardizing and the quality assurance of climate services are really the next steps where we need to work. And this is exactly uh, the topic of Climate Europe too. But, and this is the big but we think, and the reason for this business day, uh, operationalization and standardization are not really research issues uh, per se. And we know in our ongoing work in Climate Europe too, for example, the framework for standardization, which is already public, uh, we are emphasizing very much the importance of deep knowledge of the demand, the users, and the decision-making context. So this means that any operationalization effort needs to be very, very familiar with the actual needs of sectors and work with those who do have domain knowledge. So if in Climate Europe 2, we want to further mature uh, this standardization of climate services, we must listen amongst all to those who are attempting to operationalize climate information for decision making and those who work with customers. And this is what we want to do precisely in this session. So we want to truly listen to the great colleagues uh, that have uh, very kindly join us this afternoon and uh, who are already working with customers, who are researchers working with industry partners, and we want to learn from all of you and from, uh, from the discussion recommendations for Climate Europe to partners and also for climate services providers uh, regarding your experience. So the, the, the next hour is going to go as follows. We are going to have short interventions from all the panelists. You will see that there is a Q&A feature to post questions and our colleague Jorge Paz from Tecnalia will be monitoring the chat and bringing your questions after we have listened to our speakers. And without further ado, I would like to introduce to you to our first speaker today, Carol Liffman. Uh, she is Director of Risk Advisory Services in the MB's uh, North America Energy Systems Business Area, and she joins us from New York, attending Climate Week meetings. Thank you very much for the early morning. Uh, Carol has a long career uh, of cross-functional experience in the energy sector, and more recently, she has worked on ESG and climate change with an emphasis on integrating technical and non-technical risk. And then in addition, Carol has interdisciplinary educational background, uh, and she actually was uh, amongst the first to receive the sustainability and climate risk credentials from the Global Association of Risk Professionals. Carol, welcome and gladly to have you here. Please, the floor is yours. 
Ferguson and the rest of the committee for including me in this panel. Um, when I look back over my career, I like to say that the thread that ties all of the different experiences together from earth scientist, corporate strategist, mega project developer, is this notion of managing risk and uncertainty, but really emphasizing the latter point, the uncertainty. We wouldn't be in business if we weren't risk takers. However, what will disrupt operations or kill a project is that uncertainty. And climate change is the ultimate wild card. And as it unfolds, it introduces uncertainty across all the links in the value chain and across multiple time horizons. And what we hear from our customers is that they need help understanding the magnitude of that uncertainty in what seems like a time of exponential change. On a tactical level, they're also telling us they need help understanding this myriad of evolving disclosure requirements. Um, in addition to the TCFD and various EU-centric frameworks like the CSRD, uh, we have a, a SEC rule pending in the United States. There are actually 35 countries that have some type of um, climate or sustainability disclosures by 2025. So suppose you're a multinational corporation, that's a lot to sort through and comply with regulations and to understand how all of this is going to impact your operations and your reputation. In fact, a recent KPMG survey says that only one in four companies has confidence in their ESG reporting. So everyone really welcomes the convergence of the standards under the umbrella of the IFRS because it helps reduce uncertainty. We, we know from our customers, and this is reflected in surveys by, you know, by the Deloitte's or the Globe scans, that the interest in climate change, <laughs> sorry, is, you know, is really being driven by the top. The senior executives in the board are, are taking a key role in helping um, companies take a position on climate change and really see this as becoming part of their culture and brand identity. Specifically in the energy sector, companies face an increased level of scrutiny, either because of their role in producing greenhouse gases, if they're in the fossil fuel sector, or by having a dependency on an ephemeral resource, wind or radiance. And this all seems to be in flux. Um, they also have a really big land uh, footprint and use significant amounts of extractive resources. And it, we, we also have to talk about that nexus between energy production of all sorts and water usage. And uh, given the state of water resource scarcity in many parts of the world, that's putting uh, new risks into hydropower. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, our fossil fuel customers are really worried about stranded assets. Renewable customers are interested in shorter term extreme weather impacts, land use concern, circularity, and supply chain issues. Um, we see interest in working with OEMs to make sure that the components of the solar installation or wind farm um, can handle the expected extreme weather impacts. Utility customers are looking at extreme weather um, impacts on their infrastructure and also how it plays out for, for load planning. And uh, they also have a class of risks related to end use customers, including switching costs and the uh, equity. Everyone in all of these sectors is grappling with soaring um, insurance costs or even uninsurabilities in large swaths of their territory. So um, all of this also comes into play as customers grapple with facility siting decisions, incorporating future trends of climate-related <clears throat> hazards. Um, and you know, traditionally, these assessments rely on historical frequencies 
But one thing we can be sure of is that the past is not going to be the key to the future. So we have to find ways to incorporate that into our um, facility siting. And given the, the factors mentioned, um, customers are also rethinking how to construct business continuity plans, both long and short term, and how these extreme weather events may disrupt not only their own activities, but all across the value chain. We see too many examples of near misses and total breakdowns, and no one wants to have a poor response when a crisis occurs. Over the past couple of years, sophisticated modeling of physical risk has moved from a nice to have to an absolute essential, and it's become easier to secure. There are many companies that can provide a score or a data series for different hazards um, and, and many different climate scenarios. It's essential to know how that model was prepared, the data sources, and how wide that band of uncertainty is. But the data is just a start. And turning data into um, business decisions needs something else. Here, I'm putting on my hat as a board member of the Society of Decision Professionals whose motto is a great decision every time. And we know that making a great decision relies on candid dialogue and deep listening among stakeholders, as well as using a proven process. We like to refer to our process as DQ or decision quality, which helps um, decision teams maintain alignment, uncover hidden biases and issues, and really focus on an end goal of commitment to action. Um, so I'll conclude my advice to both customers and project ser um, climate services providers and the Climate Europe 2 project team. To customers, climate change should not appear as a separate risk on your risk register assigned to somebody in the climate team. The future won't unfold in the neat Cartesian coordinate matrix, your typical four by four, whatever your, your company uses. When thinking about climate risk, um, we have to think about a network diagram, that spaghetti bowl, and the uh, World Economic Forum has an excellent depiction showing all of the interconnections between climate and other significant um, sources of risk. This helps you um, really uncover coincident, compounding, cascading risks. And we need people from every discipline to collaborate in making the best decisions and keep the potential impacts on human beings at the top of our mind. And to climate service providers and the CE2 project team, as you move forward in working out the best way to standardize your services, please learn, as I have done, from specialists in the process and psychology of decision making. We are running out of time. We all need to do what we can to make decisions with confidence that can be implemented with velocity. We need to act. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Carol. Really love uh, your uh, your candid talking. Uh, certainly, a, a topic that is uh, very important uh, for for all of us. But uh, before we engage on um, further discussions, which we will, I would like to give now the floor to you, Maria Ubierna. Uh, she is Open Hydro's Chief Product Officer and leads the digital solution development with the mission to accelerate climate action. Uh, Maria has directed the creation of the most recognized framework on hydropower, climate resilience, and greenhouse gas emissions analysis. And formerly, she has also worked for the International Hydropower Association. Maria, the floor is yours. Mute. Thank you. Thank you very much, Asun, for the introduction, and thank you for uh, inviting me to this web festival. Um, I think you're seeing my presentation. Yeah, but we are seeing the speaker, the speaker screen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Not, to... not, not the presentation screen. 
No, it is. Hope. Yeah. Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, thank you very much. So I'm going to talk about my experience in the hydropower sector, which as um, the uh, Cara explained is one of the, the main sectors that is affected by climate change. And it's not just a consideration that we have in the risk register by score to the design and um, production of hydropower. So, well, hydropower um, has a dual relationship with climate change. On the one hand, it helps mitigate climate change because it is in general, and I say in general, and I will explain a little bit later why, uh, it is a low carbon energy source and displaces fossil fuel based energy generation. However, it is vulnerable to climate change impact and um, is directly influenced by the hydrological regime but not only the meteorological, geotechnical, glacial, geological processes, all of them are affected by climatic conditions and affect the design, the operations, and the planning of uh, hydropower projects. So increased frequency and intensity of droughts and reduced runoff will um, have a business disruption impact in the generation of electricity, the depletion of glaciers, ice storage, and seasonal snow cover can pose um, an opportunity to increase generation in the short to medium term. And increased precipitation variability and streams uh, can pose a big risk for dam safety. Other considerations to uh, the hydropower contest is that we need to double hydropower install capacity to meet energy targets according to the International Energy Agency Net Zero Pathway. We are building infrastructure for the next 50 to 100 years, and that's very important for um, the uh, climate uh, data services we're talking here about. And we need to consider what do we do with the existing aging infrastructure. In the sector, basically, we are mainstreaming climate uncertainty. I take um, kind of the, the the in the timeline the 2015 year because of course we is the is the year of the SDGs, is the year of the Paris Agreement, also when TCFD was established, and basically before that, um, the industry practice it was not it wasn't taking into account a climate change and a. And it was designing infrastructure with a probable maximum flood with a running hydrological models based on historical data that we know that historical data, we cannot rely on it for the future climate. So now the projects, they have to be climate proof. That means that can absorb the stresses imposed by climate change and contribute to mitigate climate change. In terms of science, before we were applying a deterministic approach to calculate those um, probable maximal precipitation and derive the probable maximum flow, which is key for the design and planning of hydropower projects, and then applying safety factors. This cannot be the case anymore. We are advancing in science and we are having um, methodolo methodological approaches to have uh, into account uh, different uh, meteorological variables. Running climate scenario analysis is now very common, even mandatory, and we are performing stress testing to understand better how um, the, the infrastructure itself, but also the generation of hydropower will be affected by climate change and introducing decision making and their deep uncertainty. In terms of a disclosure or transparency, before there was no consideration of the effects of climate change on business and investments, and they were even unaware of what will be the risk. However, now for investment, the climate disclosures are mandatory in other atmosphere, in other uh, spheres are voluntary still. And um, that climate disclosure will lead to more finance into low carbon and resilient infrastructures. So here, um, I led the development of the Climate Resilience Guide uh, in my time at IHA, the International Hydropower Association. And basically this guide, which uh, the talks started in 2015, 
It responds to the need for clarity and good international industry practice for project owners, financial institutions, governments, and private developers to consider climate risk. There was not widely accepted guidance before on how to deal with climate change risk uh, for the hydropower sector. And we um, established a multi-stakeholder process to develop it. So we involve multilateral development banks, operators, international organizations such as ICOL, consultants that are the ones using a lot of um, data and models to um, design the hydropower projects and academia. And we had a panel of experts, in fact, uh, uh, representing 50% industry and 50% academia representativeness. The climate resilience guide is for all the hydropower sector. And um, each hydropower project is very site-specific, um, conditions dependent. So how this can you know, uh, be used by all the hydropower sector? Because we have kind of different levels of risk and uh, translating the need for the guidance, but with the um, what we are facing in, in practical terms of what is the data availability that you will find in remote areas and depending on in developing countries, we have three approaches, a comprehensive approach, which is the one recommended, a semi-comprehensive, and then a basic approach for those locations where you have very low data availability. The hydrological models cannot have a very um, a fine uh, resolution and um, the risk might not be very high. And introduces a state of the art science and approaches like stress testing and managing uncertainty for decision makers. Yes, one more guideline that I wanted to bring here and is touching on the climate mitigation criteria. The climate mitigation criteria for hydropower is becoming a deal breaker. And this is recognized, for example, in the European Union taxonomy, where um, it intends to improve transparency in the market for sustainable investment products and prevent greenwashing. And climate mitigation criteria for hydropower is one of the uh, deal breaker criteria before moving into ESG um, criteria. Climate bonds are also used to finance or refinance hydropower projects, but there are concerns about the climate compatibility of those. Green Haskell's protocol new requirement for land use changes includes or recognizes that there are greenhouse gases emissions from uh, the impoundment of reservoirs. So as I say in the beginning, uh, the median life cycle emissions are 23 grams of CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour, which means it's a low carbon technology comparable to other renewable energy sources. However, um, is the, the variation between sites are, is very wide and there are streams that can be as high or higher than coal thermal power plants. That's why this criteria is becoming a must. It's very complex to estimate greenhouse gases emissions, but there is new ways of analyzing and new data that could come from satellite information to estimate these emissions. The guideline uh, that we develop basically helps understand and navigate these reporting requirements for the hydropower sector, which is crucial for its development and to accelerate the finance flow into the sector. Just to conclude, some key learnings of uh, the hydropower sector. So there is urgency to tackle the climate crisis, but considerations of climate risk cannot be overlooked. There is a need for a common language to understand, quantify, and report climate-related information and improve transparency to accelerate finance flows. It's good to incorporate scientific and technological advances uh, involving academia and technological centers, but to ensure industry uptake is necessary to collaborate with the companies. Climate services are needed to ensure the resilience of hydropower to climate related shocks and to inform measures to optimize electricity generation and early warning systems. And standards and guidance provide a framework as the ones that I presented to address the problem, but there is a need for site-specific evaluation afterwards, resilience strategy, and continuous monitoring and reporting for compliance requirements to the reduce risks and be able to adapt. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria, and thank you very much for finishing up with this uh, very important reminder that the adaptation of the renewable energy sector is actually key for actually mitigation goals. And here is everything 
interconnected. We will engage and we would like to hear more uh, really about your experiences of working with research. Uh, but first, let's give the floor to our uh, next speaker, uh, who is uh, Hamid Bastiani, a project officer specializing in integrated weather, water, and climate services for energy at the World Meteorological Organization. And Hamid uh, leads on development and implementation of tailored products and services for the energy sector by bring, bridging uh, the science to the actual application and operationalization. Thank you very much for being with us uh, today, Hamid, and please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Asun, for the invitation and uh, kind introduction. Uh, I would like to start, could you please confirm if you can see the presentation? Yeah, your presentation okay, is up. Perfect. I mean, Thank you so yeah. much. So let me start by uh, just a few slides and setting the scene. I'm sure that these uh, topics are already discussed uh, during probably the morning session, but at the same time, I would like to refer to some of the WMO publications that provides much more information. And here is the, basically the, uh, facing the reality of the climate change and where we are standing today, which is 1.15 degrees Celsius uh, air surface temperature. And depending on the mitigation measures that we take uh, or we conduct today, we will end up to be somewhere um, between 1.5 to 6 degrees by the end of the century. It is important to mention that the relationship between the increase of the temperature and the extreme events, the intensity, the frequency, and the duration, which is increasing, uh, is non-linear. So every um, basically increase in, in every single decimal really matters here. Uh, focusing on the energy sector and the impacts of this climate change on energy, and it was uh, mentioned uh, already by one of the speakers, water scarcity, which is uh, uh, an impact. Here we clearly see an example for thermal power and nuclear power that uh, over the next 20 years, 15 to 20 years, the water scarcity level, no matter uh, which water stress level we have, it could be low, medium, high, or extremely high, every single level will be doubled in 15 years. And it poses a, a high um, potential threats to mainly nuclear power plants, um, which are mainly located uh, at, uh, at coasts or at the shore of the rivers. It is uh, also the case for thermal power. And this information is extracted basically from our uh, one of our recent publication in WMO, 2022 State of uh, Climate Services, the report on energy, which has lots of more information to be uh, basically explored. One example of other impacts of the climate change for the energy sector, it's not only drought or water scarcity, but also uh, sea level rise uh, and I would like to encourage you having a look at the WMO flagship report on the uh, global state uh, that reports on seven indicators of climate change. One of them is temperature, the other one is sea level rise, and all of these seven indicators coming from uh, extracting basically from, from uh, ocean to land to atmosphere, cryosphere, clearly shows the, the potential threat for the energy sector. Here we see some examples of flooding. Uh, extreme heat waves and cold waves that could uh, worsen the situation um, when the society is extreming is, is basically exper uh, experiencing those those events. Being uh, out of electricity could worsen clearly the situation. Uh, fires is another example, and it clearly shows the vulnerability. Well, these are all case studies that we collected in the recent report, and much more is there. Um, clearly shows the, the, the vulnerability of the energy sector and the importance of taking those adaptation measures. So the energy sector is also um, has a huge potential for mitigation measures, considering that more than 70% of the CO2 emission globally comes from the energy sector. And that brings me to this slide, which talks about uh, typical uses of weather, water and climate data information and services. Uh, for the energy sector. And this one is extracted from a more recent publication of WMO, uh, Integrated Weather and Climate Services in Support of Net Zero Energy Transition, 
I invite you to have a look at it. It's a very comprehensive report talking about uh, a code development framework for a full value chain of climate services. It also talks about the role of socioeconomic benefits, uh, analysis, policy, business models, and uh, collaboration and capacity development. And I'll, uh, I'll explain a little bit more about the, uh, the code development process in the next slide. But um, focusing on the, on the image, it, it, it shows the, the wide range of application of weather and climate services from the historical data, which application is mainly on planning and financing to um, a few minutes to hours ahead. Uh, we call it now casting, mainly used for operations, a uh, few months ahead. Uh, subseasonal to seasonal, and each of those time frames basically is uh, is useful for a specific uh, application for the energy sector, maintenance, resource management, planning, and uh, and investment for long term and climate projections. In general, there is um, much more advanced weather services compared to climate services, so there is a gap here for the climate to be focused on. But also uh, uh, in in weather services. Um, and uh, now casting model could be uh, still um, the, 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 the preciseness of the now casting model could be still increased in terms of uh, temporal and uh, uh, geographical resolution. A few days ago, I came across uh, with a, a, an article, uh, which is basically a project uh, uh, lead by Google and ECMWF, and it talks about the next generation of weather forecasting using AI, uh, uh, technologies and I, I encourage again all the audience to have a look at it. It was published by the end of the August. So it clearly shows that um, the, the accuracy of the results that we have today coming out from uh, based on artificial intelligence is twice more than the NWP models we had a, a decade ago, ago more or less. So uh, it's a promising uh, basically technology um, and we will hear much more uh, in the future, but, but the application is basically now focused more on the short term forecast. For subseasonal to seasonal, understanding better the, the, the climate, the dynamic of climate anomalies could really help to increase the accuracy of the models. And um, obviously, for the projections, we need much more accuracy. And something that was again mentioned, but Again, important to be mentioned here is the uncertainty of the models that uh, we need a better um, characterizing. We need to better characterize those uncertainties, better understand those, and somehow uh, communicate it well to the users. Uh, so we found this basically gap here uh, in different projects that we have that users from agriculture sector, energy sector are not fully aware of all of those uncertainties of the models. Um, so this is basically the framework for code de code development of uh, weather, water, and climate services, and it applies in different elements of the energy supply chain from generation, if we consider as the electricity generation, to to transmission, distribution, and delivery. Uh, and as you can see, user interaction is at the heart uh, of this uh, of this framework. Um, there has been uh, uh, an advancement in, in engaging users um, during the past decade in developing these kind of services, uh, at least in some of those steps, but still uh, lots of room to, to basically for, for improvement there. And maybe here I can just uh, talk about uh, user um, requirements a little bit, which is quite important and is the foundation for usable and uh, useful weather and climate services. Sometimes it's really time consuming to collect all of those information from users, especially when we have many users or in big projects. Um, but it is important to collect those information uh, globally and, um, and share it ideally, uh, basically widely around the world. So we, we, we avoid effort duplication and at the same time, we allow action uh, in a timely way. Uh, the, the collection of these users' requirements also need to be a continuous process, given that all of these needs and requirements uh, are kind of dynamic and changing. And I would like to mention that here in WMO, we have started a, a mechanism for continuous monitoring of, of uh, users' needs, starting uh, by uh, from the public 
sector from National Meteorological Hydrological Services last year, and we collected uh, basically needs from more than 100 member states of WMO. And this year, we are focusing on the private sector. Uh, another good example of the uh, a, a database of users' needs is the C3S uh, database. Uh, and again, um, I encourage uh, audience to have a look at it, which basically covers, I apologize, which basically covers um, different, it, it includes different components. Basically, it has a forum for exchanging of information. It has uh, uh, expert teams. And at the end, based on those collected uh, requirements and needs, there is an analyzed document that could really help to, to address the needs. Um, on the right side, uh, and these information are all are extracted from our recent publication, much more explanation is there, but focusing on capacity development, which is important in all of those six uh, steps, seven steps, it doesn't only focus on infrastructural, but also procedural, institutional, and human resources. And I have um, a few examples there but maybe I can, I can explain more about it uh, during the Q&A. Also four elements for uptaking these weather and climate services, socioeconomic benefit, uh, something that we struggled a lot when we were preparing the state of climate service report, we found out that there is a lack or gap in those kind of uh, information. Um, either uh, the project uh, don't have any specific framework for those uh, socioeconomic indicators, or it is not well, documented or calculated documented business models is important as well um, and also identifying key policies so again about policies i can mention that um, in wmo we have an evolving uh, supportive resolution on on uh, uh, sharing data uh, in an open access way and we are encouraging all the members to do so uh, i would also like to mention the role of the public private partnership here and and the, the way that we are encouraging members to develop such a framework at national levels uh, with the private sectors. I can elaborate on that more later. And then finally, uh, strengthening partnership and collaborations among international organizations, but also at, at regional, sub-regional, and national levels. And that brings me to my last slide. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hamid, for presenting the, the terrific work WMO is uh, is doing. Um, and, and we want to hear a couple more things, certainly uh, from you. But uh, first, I actually wanted to invite Albert Soret and Daniel Cabezon, although I don't think uh, he has made it, um, Albert. Hi, hello. Yeah, Daniel is also here. Daniel is also here. Okay, yeah. I couldn't see it. So then give me a second to introduce you and the logic of why you're here. So uh, first of all, Albert Soret is the leader of the Earth System Services Group at the BSC. But uh, uh, the reason he is here with us today is because he was the project coordinator for S2S3, uh, Horizon Europe project that has explored climate services for the renewable energy sector. And uh, what we would like to use the next minutes is for Albert to lead us in a dialogue with one of the industry partners. Thank you, Daniel Cabezon, for being here with us, who is team leader at the Energy Assessment Department of Energías de Portugal Renewables. And Daniel has uh, over 20 years of experience in the wind energy sector, first in research and uh, in the past for the past 12 years in EDPR. So we want to learn about what you have learned about working together, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Asun. So if you want, first I can start explaining what does it mean S2S4E, so this ugly acronym. So it means that in the project, we, our aim was to combine sub-seasonal and seasonal predictions so, uh, for the energy sector. So usually when we talk about climate, we always think about long-term uh, climate trends, but uh, as we have seen in the previous uh, speaker uh, behind, he has the climate stripes showing that every year it's different with uh, anomalies of temperature. And these uh, anomalies of temperature are also uh, seen in other variables that affect the energy sectors. So like wind, we have years 
or we have periods that the winter is the, the, the wind is higher than normal or lower than normal and the same for for solar so the aim of the project was to better understand these anomalies and to combine sub-seasonal predictions so it's a forecast for the forthcoming weeks and seasonal a forecast for the forthcoming months and seasons for the um, for the energy sector and our aim was to better understand user needs uh, to this aim we involve in the project uh, different industrial partners to interact with them and uh, to better understand these needs and taking into account these these lessons learned we 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 do apply research to 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 work with the state of the art climate predictions to 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 in the end to provide the research with an impact so i guess that now daniel will explain something else about the user uh, needs in this topic Okay, hi, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Daniel Cabezon. I work for uh, EDPR. Just to put it in context, EDPR is one of the largest operators of renewable energies in, around the world. We are in 25 countries currently, and uh, we, we build and we operate um, renewable energy plants, um, particularly wind energy and solar PV plants um, in, the, in, the, in the different geographies. Uh, so, as part of this um, operation strategy, um, knowing in advance um, uh, the future available uh, um, wind or, or, or solar irradiance uh, resource in advance, it's um, quite an added value for for, uh, for these kind of companies. Um, so, for during S two S four E, this was quite a, a new technology. Um, so. Um, our role was to, to essentially to make questions, um, to, um, to uh, uh, plan different uh, user cases um, in order to, to, to test the, the, the tool uh, and also to, to verify the predictability of, of these models at the different uh, scales, at different loca locations at Europe and, uh, and North America. Uh, in order to you know to to get some confidence on on, on this kind of of model, so yeah, essentially, um, get knowledge about the the concepts of of the different skill metrics in order to get confidence on this on this technology. Um, also, for us, it uh, this this collaboration was important because um, so the, the the research that that was that was done in the project was was. Um, was guided and tailored uh, from from the users, and and it was also important for us because it uh, enabled us to to publish papers that in the end it, they had a huge impact. Okay, um, so we we were publishing papers with a scientific background, but also explaining the application. So we published papers in terms of um the weather regimes and the different synoptic situations that in the end can help to improve the simulations or to better understand uh, specific processes i uh, will explore a specific uh, downscaling and bias adjusting uh, adjustment methods taking into account the specific needs from different different users because it's not the same uh, uh, tso so the the, the grid manager operator at that specific uh, um industry that has its own uh, wind farms and, and they have different needs in terms of, of resolution. But also at the same time, uh, we, we were also publishing papers um, on how to translate all this information in some in uh, in some visuals or some information, some 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 service in the end that that was uh, facilitating this uh, this uptake of, of the service. And finally, also, uh, we did a huge effort to evaluate the information that we were providing, but not from the typical climate uh, point of view, where we when we apply different statistics, but also to, to really understand the specific decisions that they were taking and provide a, a, an, econ an economic assessment of of the of of the different decisions taking into account if they have the forecast or or they work as in a business as usual uh, protocol and and finally so it, so beyond the publications also for us it was important because this this development so in s2s4e 
we we developed the the the, the service and, and it was operational for a year and a half and and during these 18 months uh, we were providing the the forecast and we were having regular meetings we we call it uh, outlook uh, uh, symposiums where we analyze the, the forecast together with with the users and it was really useful for us also because it helped us uh, it helped us to to really explore the simulations and, and really understand the the, dif the 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 relations between the different variables and how they, they can be used in in terms of um of, on the energy sector and i don't know for you daniel your like the added value of this Yes, yes, yeah. As Albert said, um, this interaction between us and the research centers, uh, we, we think it was uh, quite bi-directional. So we think that for them it was very good to understand the the potential applications in order to to adjust or to to feed the models somehow for for that um, um, outputs um, applications like, for example, financial hedging. Uh, if we have to prevent from our financial colleagues, they, they have to prevent um, um, some hedging if we are going to be above or below uh, wind speed, for example, or wind power for the next three months, or if we want to have like um, extreme events, um, like um, extreme um, cold waves, for example, that can um, can freeze the, the, the wind turbines, for example. These kind of issues are, are very, uh, relevant in our uh, daily activities, but also it was useful for us to understand the, the limitations of, of this um, uh, climate forecast. That it, it, it's everything is not possible, and just to to make us aware that that's that's not, that's um, that's a reality. You know? uh, also, for us, it's been quite useful to to have a um, a critical judgment because um, we are uh, finding more and more companies offering this kind of services. And so I think this uh, kind of projects gave us like a, um, um, some uh, uh, judgment in order to to say, okay, this is good or this is not so good or which is the skill that that, uh, that this this particular model is having. No? Um, and th I think this fits the, the, the with the Climate Europe's tools goal of creating standards for, for this kind of um, of climate services. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much to both. Uh, we are running out of time, so I think I'm going to uh, intervene now to to allow to 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 follow up with a couple more questions uh, um, because what you are raising here is something that is very obvious, and it has been very obvious today. If you have been with us this morning, attending the session, the, first of all, the opening one, but also. Uh, the session on sustainable finance. Uh, this is a whole world. You need to be able to speak the lingo. I think, Carol, you yourself mentioned this, right? You need to be familiar with the whole supply chain of a particular renewable uh, energy. And at the same time, you need to be able to speak the lingo of climate services. So it is this breach in these different universes where it looks to me like uh, a lot of the uh, potential uh, eventual um, uh, recommendations for for trust in climate services. We need these mediators. We need some sort of intermediary processes. So I wanted to tease out uh, a little bit from you. What will be um, your recommendation to enhance the trust, but also thinking about the necessity to to be multilingual in a sense. Um, and, and also, I also would like to know more from you. What do you learn um, in terms of what, what will be your recommendations for climate services researchers, which I presume many are with us in the audience today, to really learn more about what you already know uh, without having to, to do another PhD, right? So we need, we need um, um, a lot more than a stakeholder engagement, seems to me, uh, than that. What would be your recommendation to really understand that demand, to really understand those contexts? Maybe we start with you, Carol, please. Uh, well, it all comes down to, to really listening. Um, you know, I, 
a lot of times we can get into uh, debates, but that doesn't that's that's proving our position. And in this case, we really need to understand um, where all of the different stakeholders are coming from. You know, there's this idea of um, every every effort needs a code switcher, somebody who can understand the scientific information as well as the more humanistic information that has to come together to uh, to create good solutions. So if you if you haven't identified a code switcher on your team, I, I really recommend that idea. Thank you, Carol. That is uh, very interesting. And it's, uh, I guess, complementary to the candid talking that you were saying in the decision uh, organization, uh, which is the key to good decision making uh, as well. Maria, uh, can I ask you? So, so you, 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 you seem to me to be somebody who also has this uh, capacity to bridge across different universes between the climate research and the world of the professional world of hydropower. What would be your recommendations for researchers to really learn more about that demand uh, that you know exists in, in that particular sector? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Axon. Um, yes, indeed, the working at the interface is challenging. And for me, well, it's it one of the uh, assignments also of my job to be a, that mediator. So one of the challenges that I see more often is the translation of uncertainty. So it's very familiar for researchers to work with, with uncertainty and it's kind of key for the climate data and climate services, but to translate that and convey that uncertainty for decision makers, like the decision maker wants a number in the end and that cannot happen anymore. So how to convey that uncertainty in ways that the decision maker is comfortable with the, um, the data that you are providing in order to make an informed decision that in fact, even they can adjust or, or, or make adaptation measures as, as years pass by or embed it into a, a strategy or monitoring. I think that's kind of crucial and sometimes we we forget, you know, in the academia they forget like how to uh, present information for decision makers that they can ut utilize. That would be one of the recommendations about around uncertainty. Um, and then um, the the learning, I would say, is to find a compromise between the excellence of the climate service and the timeline of the industry. So that's why in the guidance, we did like these three approaches, the comprehensive, the comprehensive and basic. I didn't enter into the detail of what would be the modelings and data that we uh, recommend for each of them, but mainly is to find that compromise between the com excellence that would be the comprehensive approach, uh, incorporating all the state of the art, like the most advanced uh, models and the final uh, uh, time steps, but in the end, you know, a climate risk assessment for very large hydropower projects maximum can last like one year, one year and a half, 18 months. That's what financiers were commissioning consultants to do, and they were struggling to do, um, you know, all the ensembles of uh, climate projections and putting together hydraulic models that they have to be uh, site specific. They cannot be a standard uh, model for, for every project. And that's why then the basic approach is so something that can be run in six months. Um, so that's kind of the compromise uh, that they need to find researchers, researchers with the being pragmatic. Thank you very much. This is a very important point also for a project like Climate Europe too, where we really need to advance on understanding uh, the processes of standardization without having a complete knowledge. And, and in a sense, that's uh, very similar to standardization processes where you actually, what you need is a proper consensus and it takes a long time, but there is a lot of precursors to that some, somehow uh, fully done a standard and, and we need to make decisions uh, before we have those standards being done. So that process in between 
that you indicate, Maria, and that balance between the efficiency and the excellence is a, is a very, very good uh, point. Thank you very much. Hamid, on to you. I, I was very, um, uh, obviously, WMO, which is also Partners in Climate Europe too, uh, has a lot of experience, but I recall that at, the, at one point in your presentation, you said that you were now in the process of specifically targeting the private sector. Can we hear a little bit more about the, the do you have a special stakeholder strategy? Uh, is it similar to those steps that you presented in your last slide? Can you tell us a little bit more about how, how do you envision this process? Thanks so much, Jason, for the question. So uh, we developed a survey. This is uh, basically the approach that we have, and uh, we are reaching out to the private uh, sector, private companies, let's say, either through the national uh, meteorological services, and also by, uh, by 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 searching, reaching out to them, encouraging them to uh, to fill out the survey. And we have we are basically putting all of this information in an online platform which will be launched by the end of the year. And we have different profiles there. We have country profiles that shows the actual status of weather and climate services in countries. Information comes from public sector. We also have um, company profiles, uh, private profiles that uh, basically is based on the information that we collect, academic profiles and international profiles. And we consider it as an engage and network platform that we basically link the requirements and needs to the service providers. It could be a company in another com uh, continent, but it's also a way of, uh, of, of the knowledge sharing as well. So, uh, yeah, uh, if you uh, check our portal, our uh, current activity uh, web page, you will you will hear more about the upcoming platform and the the time of the launch. Thank you, and this uh, th this is uh, also very relevant to the point that I wanted to make in relation to 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 your um, to your points, Albert and, and and Daniel. Thank you very much. I, uh, Daniel, you said that uh, towards the end of your intervention that uh, one of the most important benefits of working with the S two S four E project is to truly understand. Uh, the, the actual available scientific information and the appropriate scientific information, right? And this comes, uh, but but how can we, let's say, scale up that? Um, because uh, it cannot be done, it's not possible to be done by all different companies or different uh, renewable energy providers to participate in projects. Is there any any fast track of 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 that 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 you could recommend to your colleagues, so to speak, you you see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah I understand. Uh, yeah, it, it's not an easy path because uh, no. at the end of the day, I mean, we are in the front edge of the companies um, between the um, European projects and, and the private sector or the rest of the company, but we have, to, we, I have to admit that we have to to make a a, a strong effort to sometimes to translate the information uh, into something more more practical um, and, and and that's not easy you know, because uh, you have to give the most important information but without losing the the, the, the details you no know? um, I think this kind of projects like s 2 s 4 e helped on this because we had the opportunity to invite um, to the to the meetings uh, some other colleagues from trading um, or, or the financial department, because I, I'm fo more focused on the meteorology part. Uh, but I think um, getting some guidelines on, uh, on or, or, or like this project, for example, or some stand standards or practical guidelines um, could help a lot in the future in order to distribute the, the outputs of the models in a more practical way and, and to put them into, into the chain of the decision making. Process. Thank you very much. And uh, the slide in the presentation is a big cue that we need to finish. I knew we will be running out of time. Um, I don't know if there is any questions pending on the Q&A, Jorge, but uh, our speakers will still be able to respond in writing uh, to whatever remaining question is there, because I need to hand over uh, to Yaro and to Paco. But before I do that, 
Thank you so much to all of you for your presentations. Your knowledge is extremely valuable for this project. We need to listen to you. And I will say we need to sort of do uh, some, some secondment with someone of you in order to truly, truly learn about the work that you do and your needs so we can generalize and therefore standardize. So thank you very much. And back to you, Yaro and Paco. Thank you very much, Asun. That was amazing. It was a uh, so a rich session and so many interesting insights and uh, uh, many interesting messages. So thank you very much, uh, the distinguished panelists and, uh, and Asun, especially for you. You have played an uh, incredibly important role in organizing this web still. Um, staying behind the several session and taking active part as the moderator. So uh, we really appreciate your work. So thank you very much for that, Asun. I will call upon you in a second and bring you back to the stage uh, as we will be uh, talking about the different sessions, especially from yesterday's. There were several breakout groups uh, and there was no time to report back properly. But before doing that, I would like to uh, ask Angel to join me here on the stage. Here I am, Jaro and everyone. Thank you. Hi. And of course, Paco. Paco, welcome. Um, so before we uh, will ask our distinguished uh, rapporteurs from different sessions to share their thoughts, may I ask you your personal opinions? So uh, what is your impression from the webstival and uh, what do you take home as a key message from across the different interesting session? Uh, Angel, would you like to start first? Yeah, absolutely. I think that this has been uh, a very interesting, and as I have been mentioning too, at least uh, I think that some, from some comments I have heard, I think that people also share this idea that it's, it has been fun and it's, it's nothing better when, than, than finding your, your time uh, valuable in terms of uh, professional value, but also in terms of, you know, you want more. And that's something I haven't seen here. I don't know what you think about that, uh, Jaro. Uh, has been has been very enriching and and, and the dynamics uh, that we have seen is uh, has been super super nice um yeah i fully agree yes uh, what i have seen is uh, like this uh, learning together exchanging the information and uh, like informing one another about what's going on what are the opportunities and so on i think this series of web festivals is taking off very nicely right we only started in march and this is the second edition but we have already covered a number of the very relevant policy all innovation initiatives which is very good and we have created this community of people who turn to us in order to learn more about what's going on but also yeah. share the ideas what we should be uh, taking care of so i really think the web festival is starting to take a uh, take off and uh, it's uh, set to become one of the major event into the future yeah and and it's, it's exactly what we want with climb europe too because uh, because this is a very large consortium and we already have 32 partners but it's uh, you know it's reaching well beyond the consortium itself and as we have seen these couple of days um you know it's it's like uh, it's an international it's a, it's a beyond europe uh, initiative so this is really aligned with our goals of building and supporting an equitable community of climate services we're extremely extremely happy about that and and my impression is that by itself um means a, a very successful event in this sense I fully agree. And this is thanks to all the partners that have been working on the web festival. Ella, it's Ella, you know, the whole consortium of Climate Europe too, in the first place, the coordinating entity, Barcelona Supercomputing Center, but many, many others, Ella, the, the technical Ella, colleagues from Euro Mediterranean Center on Climate Change, the session organizer, Rumble, uh, DNRV, and, and many others, but especially our distinguished guests and panelists from all uh, around Europe and beyond bringing the expertise. So that was really fantastic. Yeah, along along with the participation of, of you know, the commission and, and the mission, the different perspective and, and their point of view in terms of, you know, policy implementation, adaptation has been outstanding. And all, obviously uh, we uh, made an effort and I think it went really, really well, thanks to the participation of everyone to focus this festival more on the business side. So it has been enlightening to, to, to get this discussion 
involved in the finance sector, the finance sector and the energy sector. I'm extremely happy about that, Jaro. Fantastic. Yeah, really. Paco, would you like to share one quick thought about uh, your personal impression from the across the sessions? Yeah, very, very quickly. Thanks a lot, uh, Yaro and Angel, for the uh, the uh, very nice summary of uh, efforts and contributions. Uh, the, what, what I take from the Webstival is, on one side, that it's a very much needed instrument. Uh, it's a, it's a unique instrument that uh, the uh, the European Community is giving itself to identify what are the components and the challenges that uh, that are behind uh, the. Uh, the standardization of uh, climate services. Um, I, I also want to. I, I also take home the uh, the, uh, the 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 idea that uh, it's quite difficult to reach beyond academia, and that we we were perfectly aware of it. Uh, Yaro, you always mentioned this thing, and uh, I think the Webstival is making this visible, is making it tangible. It's uh, it's also offering opportunities to identify who could be those actors that uh, help us to uh, get a bit a foot into into the uh, the communities that uh, we want to really reach and uh, and and get get in touch with. Uh, it's it's going to be uh, a, a yeah a, a long term goal. It's uh, it's it will require many more web festivals, unfortunately, and I say unfortunately not because I don't enjoy them. I think they are really great opportunities to keep learning, but because they, it's it's a massive amount of effort, and uh, I say this mainly uh, for uh, in 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 the name of all those colleagues that you don't see that are behind the organization of these uh, these events and that um basically are spending days on uh, on on uh, on uh, just working very hard to to make this possible the uh, web festivals are very hard work very very hard work if we want to make it uh, efficient they are an instrument for uh, reaching a community that goes well beyond Climate Europe too, and that makes it even harder because we need to identify that community. But I think we are very lucky to count on a team of uh, people behind the organization of the web festivals that are really committed and that are making a difference. And uh, I would like to thank them all uh, and uh, basically keep encouraging them to keep making a difference. Oh, thank you very much, Paco, for that. And indeed, uh, the web festivals, we will organize a number of festivals and web festival in the future, and there will be still uh, the room to improve and bring new people. But uh, I fully agree and uh, join you in thanking all those that have contributed uh, in different ways and to different degrees to making this web festival um, a success. Paco, if, if we, we have touched upon these already a little bit, you have mentioned that in the opening session. So the next uh, gathering will not be a webstival, it will be a festival. And the festival means that we will finally meet in person. We used to meet in person in the Climate Europe first edition. And, and then we are returning back to physical contact. Um, so uh, I can give a little bit of uh, uh, flavor uh, about the festival that will uh, take place around March, uh, but with some flexibility a little bit earlier, a little bit later, depending on how it overlaps with other very important events and what the opportunities are. Most likely, the festival will take place uh, in Venice uh, or in Belgrade. I mean, there's still ongoing discussion. I think it's uh, there are more... Um, uh, chances that the web festival uh, that the festival will take place in uh, in in Venice rather than Belgrade, but but then the final edition of the festival will be in Belgrade anyway. Um, so Paco, if you if I may ask you, what is what would be your expectation on the physical gathering? So we have already had twice the digital um, gathering uh, web festival. But what do you think, what is the new opportunity uh, when we will meet in person? What will be different? Well, the uh, the human contact makes a huge difference when it when it comes to learning and ex exchanging experiences. Uh, my expectation will be that all these initial contacts and impressions that we are gathering in these web festivals, in the online events, will materialize. And that with uh, everything that we have learned so far will be probably more efficient in conveying what we are after in uh, Climate Europe 2. And uh, at the same time, 
we, we might be uh, better prepared to formulate the right questions to those attending. It will be a real challenge to bring along all those that we want to reach, or at least representatives of those communities, but we'll make everything in our power, as you know well, uh, to, to, to make this a reality. It's, it's, uh, you, you were referring to the festivals from uh, the uh, Climate Europe projects that were the uh, pioneers. Um, and it's, uh, it's also important to remind that the festivals were uh, from the beginning conceived not as scientific events. They are not workshops, they are not conferences, they are gatherings of people that are interested in discussing, exchanging, in, uh, uh, in ex and sharing their experiences in terms of uh, climate services uh, in, a, in, a, in an environment that is relaxed, in which uh, there is not a very uh, definitely set agenda in which surprises happen. And uh, this, is, this is again a challenge, but I think it's an opportunity to really go beyond uh, the, these, uh, the, the, the experiences that we've had with the two web festivals and uh, make the most of uh, this uh, human contact to get uh, better uh, experiences, more first-hand uh, impressions and experiences that uh, we, uh, we have to really collect and uh, use for the uh, formulation of uh, the recommendations for the standardization of climate services. Brilliant, thank you very much. And this is also an invitation to everybody from the community, you that are listening to this session, well, uh, uh, colleagues from Climate Europe too, and colleagues from other initiatives. So, uh, uh, please share with us your thoughts about how the physical gathering could look like, what you would expect, what you would uh, recommend to, to take on board when we are designing the agenda. So, we would very much like to co-design this with you and the, uh, there are multiple opportunities how you can contribute to shaping the agenda. At this stage, I would suggest that we invite all the rapporteurs, uh, especially from yesterday's breakout groups to open the uh, video camera to identify themselves as those that uh, will uh, uh, um, inform us about what's, what has been discussed, uh, especially in the breakout groups and uh, as the different uh, rapporteurs uh, are gathering, I would invite Asun to join us. Asun, you have organized this wonderful mission adaptation um, uh, session yesterday afternoon, and then we went into breakout groups and had uh, a brilliant discussion. So I think uh, it was really very interesting to learn across uh, the different uh, organizations that are involved in the mission adaptation, as well as from our speakers from European Commission, what is the current stage. And you have been one of the ground uh, uh, mothers of, of the mission adaptation itself. Well, uh, you, you personally have contributed heavily shaping the agenda. So what is your uh, impression of that uh, uh, session? And uh, do you have some uh, key points that you would like to share with the audience? Thank you, Jaro. I have done a little bit of the homework uh, by, uh, by, by gathering here and there uh, some of the results of uh, what happened in the different breakout uh, rooms. But uh, for, for, for all of you who maybe uh, didn't uh, manage to attend yesterday afternoon, uh, the adaptation mission, which, as I said, is uh, one of the most exciting uh, and interesting uh, initiatives at the European level, uh, today is also obviously extremely difficult to implement. Um, uh, and, and what was very clear for everybody is that there is no question about the relevance of climate services for the implementation, given that it can enable this transformational change that is promoted by the mission on adaptation. And very much specifically, I will say, because you and I know this very well, the first objective of the mission and all the other two that are on top, which rely completely on this one, is about preparing Europe for climate disruptions through a better understanding, preparation and management of climate change risk. And this requires quality assured, relevant, user-driven and trusted uh, climate services. So this was very much uh, on agreement by everybody. And then just uh, one more minute uh, sharing some key issues related to uh, existing knowledge of bad experiences and known challenges that we also heard across all the different breakout groups 
And we basically heard different versions of cases where adaptation decisions had been made were poorly uh, were poorly made, resulting from poor climate services or inadequate climate services, services that had been framed in ways difficult to operationalize and often not necessarily good because of an arbitrary selection of climate data or of the wrong scenarios. Another reason we heard is experiences with being very clearly uh, taking decisions or trying to implement something with partial data. And that the task is very complex, which requires managing many different sources of data in many different uh, forms, uh, formats. Um, and and Kisa, per, perhaps a, a very interesting point that I wanted to highlight today in the concluding remarks is that we also heard that many national level and public uh, uh, providers of climate services were telling us um, that they lack resources. There is a lack of competence of that multilingualism that I said earlier we need to do. And, and that was also a hurdle to, to ensure that climate services are fit for purpose. And then the last reason I wanted to highlight for things not working well, where uh, standards and quality assurance can help uh, mission colleagues, is related to existing adaptation plans at con country level or local level, where those plans were not done using an appropriate stakeholder engagement. And it was very interesting to see how not very good the stakeholder engagement processes uh, and inclusive processes leads to bad adaptation, but also prevents from the improvement of climate information for decision making. So clearly designing a sound engagement strategy from the very beginning is key to the whole process. And I leave it there. Fantastic. Yeah, that was really excellent summary. And I'll, uh, I, I just add that this is not uh, the end of our collaboration with the uh, mission implementation platform uh, for mission adaptation. We will probably be in touch and working together closely also in the future and also during the next webstival. So we're looking forward to learning more how the regions then use the climate services, how they translate the standards and quality assurance criteria into practice. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Asun. And now I would like to invite uh, my colleagues from the project uh, I'll, uh, to report a little bit back about what they take home uh, from uh, the discussion where we explain what this project is uh, doing. So we had four uh, work streams and uh, we have been talking about a number of issues. And the first one, Angel, now turning to you, the first one is uh, how do we act under the uh, condition of uncertainty? So uh, you uh, um, discussion, the thematic dialogue, uh, uh, grouping, uh, uh, informing others and, and, and showcasing what we have been doing in the project uh, uh, was dedicated exactly to this topic. So what is your key uh, take home message and what you have learned and what is there something important to share with the audience? Absolutely. We learned that there's still a lot to learn about this topic, that indeed we all uh, face uh, decision-making processes from very simple to very complex every day, every hour. And we know how to navigate and how to uh, make these decisions under uncertainty. So in a way, it's not uh, something new. We all humans, we all need to do this all the time. When we face the possibility of having better informed decisions because we have, for example, better climate information, our job might be uh, slightly uh, easier uh, sometimes, but not always. Something very, very interesting about this uh, pretty unique interaction between two uh, world packages that are, if you want, um, uh, on, 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 the, on the table, but, but looking at the same problem from, from, from very different angles, world package five more on the um, social science aspects, or even in this particular case, more on the anthropological side of things, and we're packaged to more on, if you want, on the climate science side of things, or data, climate data side of things. Um, the, 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 the interaction, you know, led to, to concrete examples in which we can see that um, the, the, local knowledge or customary practices or or you know the knowledge that we all acquire by experience or through 
uh, family, friends, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, can actually uh, overlap uh, in a nice way with the the uh, so-called scientific knowledge and scientific both from the natural sciences and the social sciences through that uh, nice interaction. Of course, this does not mean that we uh, need to embrace pseudoscience or or um, uh, clearly fake uh, facts or information. We need to be always very careful about that. But it, we 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 found that it was possible. For example, there are there are key uh, real world um, um, experiences related to uh, financial instruments to transfer climate risk, uh, uh, in particular in developing countries, in which this local knowledge or or uh, we were uh, asked not to call it traditional knowledge. Um, so so I, I will keep aligned with the customary practices or, or, or local knowledge can be integrated, can be a part of the decision-making process when it's uh, uh, married with, with robust scientific information. So at the end, as I said at the very beginning, we learned that there is a lot still to, to, to do because uncertainty is always permeating all our decisions and our decisions will be uh, better in, 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 in if we can integrate uh, the best information uh, possible. Thank you, yeah. Jarvan. Fantastic, yeah, brilliant. Now, Andreas, you in your breakout group uh, and the uh, thematic dialogue, you have addressed quality assurance. So what is your take home message or something mm -hmm. you would like to share with us? Yeah, thank, thanks very much, Jaro, for having the opportunity. Thank you, uh, first of all, everybody for organizing this uh, really very exciting uh, web civil uh, the last two days. So I called uh, these our uh, our session from uh, Haute Couture to prêt à porter somehow. Uh, so we are trying to get uh, an idea how standardization could support high quality climate services. So we learned a lot about uh, the, standard, uh, the standardization processes, also by uh, the experiences uh, which were brought to us from uh, WMO. Amir Delju had a, a very uh, provided a very good insight into uh, the, the quality assurance um, of climate services. Uh, already performed by WMO, how these processes work, um, what the well, uh, the timelines on this, uh, these are what the uh, how the process looks like. So we 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 learned, I think, uh, both uh, the standardization group and also the say quality uh, people uh, a lot from each other, um, and uh, um, we really think uh, that we have now a much better mutual understanding about uh, these two streams, how we perhaps get them better together, how we uh, really do a better or uh, do a good standardization of processes that contribute to a better quality of climate services in future. Uh, and all this, I think, should lead to um, a better uh, and more transparent and a more trustful uh, process is particular on the, in particular on the user side so i think this is uh, has been shown here during the past two days that building uh, mutual understanding transparency and trust is essential for a successful and high quality climate service and uh, so we have to find routes to really convey our knowledge um, to the users or together with the users develop uh, solutions um, that uh, provide uh, the the answers they they need for uh, adaptation to uh, to climate change and climate variability thank you fantastic thank you uh, thank you andreas i fully subscribe all what you have said also from my perspective Judith, uh, uh, your thematic dialogue was about community and communication. So what you would like to share with our audience and with the rest? What are the key take-home messages? Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, well, um, yes, our session was more about uh, uh, building a community and, uh, and the communication aspects of uh, the Climate Europe 2 project. Uh, firstly, we had a presentation of the art and science school that uh, CPN is uh, working on. Uh, art, it it's, was a, a conclusion from the previous uh, Climate Europe project that 
art uh, speaks more to people than uh, than science sometimes. So in this project, we want to make use of that effect again. And so this uh, art and science call is uh, inviting artists to uh, yeah to present their ideas. Then these um, uh, a number of ideas will be selected and will be used in the roadshow that is also planned by uh, our project, uh, in which we will visit uh, mainly Eastern European countries uh, with a, what's, what's called a climate village to involve people and to, yeah, to uh, tell them more about uh, climate change and interact. Um, the second uh, important uh, uh topic was the uh, climate europe to platform that is uh, being developed uh so we had a very nice um, discussion on it and uh, these ideas uh will uh yeah be implemented in a beta version of the of the platform and this platform will then be uh, a place where uh, uh providers and users can interact and work on documents together, for example. Now, in almost the last moments of this um, festival, I heard that uh, WMO is also uh, going to la launch a platform, or maybe it already has, and I really think that we should get in touch uh, with them. So that's it for me. Thank Fantastic. you. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Edith. And we are all looking forward to learning more about the old show and the taking part in it. Very quickly from uh, our side, I, I uh, together with uh, with colleagues, uh, we've been managing the uh, value and business innovation, and we also had a very interesting discussion about how closely interact, uh, how closely connected are the value and benefits that are being unleashed by government services, and uh, and the business innovation that is looking into how to deliver this value to alert to the final user how to retain part part of that value in order to sustain the cost and so on so we have been talking about the uh, provision of private climate services and uh, and public uh, provision of services finally we concluded that probably the most interesting way is a cooperation between public and private and there are multiple ways of collaborating using the publicly uh, paid uh, observational records uh, adding a uh, and value from innovative uh, uh, private sector developed application and using it back in the in the public sector or creating a revenue stream that harness the strengths uh, from both sides. So this is probably the key message that the future is the collaboration between public and private. And last but not least, uh, Elko, thank you very much for organizing the very interesting session uh, that was opening for the second day of, uh, of the focus on the business and uh, and uh, and finance. Uh, so what would be, from your point of view, the key messages uh, that you have heard during in your session? And thinking, yeah, so indeed, indeed my, the session uh, this morning was really a big picture type of, uh, of session. And uh, it left me with a sense of responsibility, I should say. I mean, our CEO of uh, Energy System painted a, a, a desirable future of the future ener energy landscape. But it's not only desire, but it's also possible. Well, with possibility comes responsibility, because that possibility is grounded in protecting those future renewable energy assets and protection against climate change effects. And I think that should be based on high quality climate climate services. And if you combine that with the sort of the, the warning or the writing on the wall that Paco shared with us, that there might be sort of a liability consequences associated with providing the wrong advice, that the, the wrong decisions are made. Uh, I think that comes to, that that comes down to responsibility to the climate services uh, uh, community. We know that finance will flow towards renewable energy. We've seen from the EC through Sophie's presentation there's a huge new huge effort being done at EC level to steer finance to to green to, to basic to green investment. But that green investment should be based also on high quality climate services so that the right decisions are made for siting and exploitation of those future re renewable e energy assets. So, so that is my takeaway from my morning's session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elka. 
And this is all what we had time for today. So this is uh, basically the end of the second uh, lab festival of Climate Europe G. Thank you very much uh, to all our rapporteurs, to all, all session organizers, to you participants connecting to, from different places around the globe. And uh, uh, without any further ado, I hand over to Paco for the farewell message and uh, final uh, goodbye. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Yaro, again. Uh, just a couple of words. Uh, the uh, sessions have been recorded. They'll be available in the uh, uh, YouTube channel of uh, Climate Europe 2. Uh, we'll also share some uh, reports of uh, the uh, conclusions uh, from uh, this webstival that uh, we'll be uh, very keen on uh, getting feedback from the rest of the community that uh, and, uh, make the most of the time that uh, the uh, uh, project partners have put into the organization of this webstival. Again, thanks very much to all those that have been involved in the organization of the webstival. And uh, also uh, the uh, 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 thanks to all those that attended as uh, participants in, uh, in uh, the different forms, panelists, speakers, and uh, attendants that followed the different sessions. Um, I hope that uh, we'll meet again in a few months' time, uh, either in Venice or in uh, or in uh, uh, um, um, uh, Belgrade. Okay. But uh, yeah, somehow in the meantime, you'll keep listening to uh, well, you'll keep hearing about uh, Climate Europe too, and uh, receiving requests from us. And again, don't hesitate to contact us if you have anything interesting to say about climate uh, services, in particular bad experiences. We need to learn from what, does, uh, what doesn't work. Thanks very much again. Goodbye. Goodbye to everybody. Bye-bye and thank you very much. Bye. Bye.